Thanks very much, Ginny. Good morning, everyone. I'm just going to quickly grab this stool here. Sorry. I'll try and remember to put this back. Um, we'll see at the end of the message if I still remember that. Oh, uh, yeah, my name's Will. I'm one of the pastors here at Greenpoint. Um, apologies for my voice this morning. It's just a little bit croaky. Um, but yeah, we're continuing on in a bit of a series. Just quickly wanted to address the announcement about soccer yesterday. It was a little bit um, of an unfortunate result. I'm part of that team city where we were versing Hope, you see. And uh, yeah, it was a bit of a, a classic case of in the B-grade comp, we uh, have a couple of teams who are probably on the cusp of that A's or the B's. They're, we're, it's a bit of a social comp, and um, there's a couple of teams that are probably a bit too serious to be in the Bs, but not quite good enough to be in the As. So we were on the receiving end of that yesterday, and uh, do you know what? We knew we were in trouble when we turned up, and they had a full whiteboard with magnets to move around and everything like that. We thought, oh, this is going to be bad. <coughs> yeah. I'm counting it as 7-1, though. I, I gave away a penalty that I don't think was a penalty, so 7-1. We'll call it 7-1. Um, <laughs> that's a lot better, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, I've got a bit of a question for you. Um, question for you to think about. It's up there on the screen. Uh, if you could ask God for anything, what would you ask for? Um, we, don't, we, we used to do this a bit more. We don't, haven't done it as much lately, but I think we're going to bring it back a bit more. Um, I'd like you to turn to somebody near you. It's only going to be for about a minute. I'd love you to discuss that question. There's no right or wrong. It doesn't have to be a fully serious answer. It also doesn't have to be a particularly noble answer. Uh, just it can be a fun answer or a lighthearted, or it can be serious. It's whatever you want it to be. But just for a minute with the people near you, if you could have a quick chat, have a think. If you could ask God for anything, what would you ask for? Is that okay? Take a minute. Maybe Luke can throw on some little discussion music, but just have a chat. All right, I'll wrap you up there. Hopefully you had a chance to share something or think of something. Can be tricky when you're, when you're chatting that, you know, make sure everyone around you is involved. But anyway, just a minute. Um, so today we're in week two of just a little mini-series. It's kind of like a gap between some bigger series, but it's a little mini-series called More to the Story. And just as we were thinking about it, we wanted a bit of a change of pace. We're doing a very, like rich and meaty dive into um, Thessalonians, wanted a bit of a change of pace and uh, thinking about it, lots of different stories of the Old Testament, uh, often taught in Sunday school and scripture classes for kids, um, but not often taught or preached on here sort of in, you know, grown up church. And in reality, uh, these stories really contain a lot of ideas and themes uh, that are quite valuable to us as adults as well. And often the, the kids' version has to be kind of simplified a bit or, or toned down. Some of the stuff's not always appropriate for kids. Um, and so if all we ever know is the Sunday school version of these stories, um, potentially we're missing out on some really rich sections of God's Word. So we're doing these three weeks of different Old Testament stories. Last week we did the story of Esther, which is one of my favorite stories. It's a very fun and kind of comedic story. Um, <laughs> it is, it is. Um, if you didn't catch it, um, you can watch it back on YouTube. Um, but this week is a little bit of a change of pace, a bit of a different sort of a story. Uh, and we're going to be looking at the story of a man named Solomon. I did do a version of this back in 2016. If you remember that, uh, I'm flattered. <laughs> I don't think many people will. Um, you probably know the story anyway, or well, some people, I'm sure, will know the story. My, people might know bits and pieces. If you're coming at it with fresh eyes, then, then that's exciting. Uh, but yeah, today we are doing the story of King Solomon. And really, Solomon's story um, starts with his father, David. David is one of the most famous kings in all of Israel's history. Um, David's a man who's incredibly successful. And under his reign, um, Israel reaches kind of the peak of its powers. Even today, yeah, when people look back on the history of Israel, often this time during the reign of King David and then King Solomon is kind of seen as like the golden age for Israel. Uh, so you can see I've got a map on the next slide. Um, you can see there how large the empire that Solomon inherited from David is. If you're not quite sure what you're looking at, 
You can see there that sea is the Mediterranean Sea. And then the bottom left of that map is Egypt. Like this is, yeah, on that sort of east bank of the Mediterranean. And, uh, yeah, you can see, I think, in the red there, how big the land of the people of Israel was when King David's reign started. And then you can see what it expanded to there in the orange. Um, Near the end of his life, David decided to do a bit of a census to see if he went to war, how many men uh, are in the country that could fight in the army. Like, so he did a bit of a count, like a head count. I mean, we do a census uh, now, a bit different. But he, he was just to get a, a gauge on how many people there were fit for active service. And so um, it was divided into 12 tribes, and two of the tribes that um, the men in those tribes wouldn't fight they were set aside for other duties. So just in 10 of the tribes, and like I said, only the men, and only the men sort of who were fit for service, so of a certain age and health and stuff, the census came back um, that there are 1.1 million men in the kingdom. And this is in ancient times, so this is, this is a lot of people. 1.1 million men in the kingdom fit for active service. And again, that's not everyone. That's not even the women and the children and the people for those other two tribes. So for a very short period of time, Israel is actually kind of one of the powerhouses of the ancient world. And that's the kingdom that Solomon inherits. A pretty good inheritance. Um, And David, we're told, um, was a man after God's own heart. He walked very closely with God during his life. God really blessed his rule and the kingdom under his reign. And God wants to bless Solomon too. That question that I um, asked you to share with the person beside you, if you could ask God for anything, what would you ask for? That's a question that was a reality for Solomon. Uh, Let's have a look in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, verses 5 to 14. One night, while Solomon was in Gibeon, the Lord God appeared to him in a dream and said, Solomon, ask for anything you want, and I will give it to you. Solomon answered, My father David, your servant, was honest and did what you commanded. You were always loyal to him, and you gave him a son who is now king. Lord God, I'm your servant, and you've made me king in my father's place. But I'm very young and know so little about being a leader. And now I must rule your chosen people, even though there are too many of them to count. Please make me wise and teach me the difference between right and wrong. Then I will know how to rule your people. If you don't, there is no way I could rule this great nation of yours. God said, Solomon, I'm pleased that you asked for this. You could have asked to live a long time or to be rich, or you could have asked for your enemies to be destroyed. Instead, you asked for wisdom to make right decisions. So I'll make you wiser than anyone who has ever lived or ever will live. I'll also give you what you didn't ask for. You'll be rich and respected as long as you live. And you'll be greater than any other king. If you obey me and follow my commands as your father David did, I'll let you live a long time. So Solomon literally gets asked um, what he would like. He gets the choice to have anything. I wonder how many of us, when sharing with the person next to you, said wisdom to know the difference between right and wrong. My guess is probably not many of us. Uh, It certainly isn't what I would have asked for. Um... But that's what, that's what Solomon asked for. He wants to be a good king. He wants to lead his people well. So God grants his request. And because Solomon has chosen such a noble thing, um, God says that he'll bless him in those other ways too. And in the very next passage, we come to a famous, a well-known story where we see the wisdom of Solomon on display. Um, in chapter 3, verses 16 to 28. One day, two women came to King Solomon, and one of them said, Your Majesty, this woman and I live in the same house. Not long ago, my baby was born at home, and three days later, her baby was born. Nobody else was there with us. One night, while we were all asleep, she rolled over on her baby, and he died. Then, while I was still asleep, she got up and took my son out of my bed. She put him in her bed, then she put her dead baby next to me. In the morning, when I got up to feed my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him in the light, I knew he wasn't my son. No, the other woman shouted. He was your son. My baby is alive. 
The dead baby is yours, the first woman yelled. Mine is alive. They argued back and forth in front of Solomon until finally he said, Both of you say this live baby is yours. Someone bring me a sword. A sword was brought and Solomon ordered, Cut the baby in half. That way each of you can have part of him. Please don't kill my son, the baby's mother screamed. Your majesty, I love him very much, but give him to her. Just don't kill him. The other woman shouted, go ahead and cut him in half. Then neither of us will have the baby. Solomon said, don't kill the baby. Then he pointed to the first woman. She is his real mother. Give the baby to her. Everyone in Israel was amazed when they heard how Solomon had made his decision. They realized that God had given him wisdom to judge fairly. So God had asked for wisdom, and this is an example um, of a story, this, this well-known story. Um, but this is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, the kind of wisdom that Solomon had, not just to make good decisions like that, but even just in terms of the things that he knew about and his ability to learn and understand things. Um, in chapter 4, this is what it says. Solomon was brilliant. God had blessed him with insight and understanding. He was wiser than anyone else in the world, including the wisest people of the East and of Egypt. Solomon became famous in every country around Judah and Israel. Solomon wrote 3,000 wise sayings and composed more than 1,000 songs. He could talk about all kinds of plants, from large trees to small bushes, and he taught about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. Kings all over the world heard about Solomon's wisdom and sent people to listen to him teach. Everyone wanted to hear what Solomon had to say. People came from all over the world um, just to hear him teach. I love that kind of, it's almost this ancient David Attenborough kind of figure. He's going around, you know, observe the spotted bullfrog that, I don't know. So not only is Solomon um, being given this gift of, of wisdom, he's, he's sort of a genius um, but as God said he would, Solomon is also popular and rich. So I, I'm going to like fill in the gaps, but most of the storytelling is going to come from the Bible itself. That's sort of just a good way of doing it. Um, so we're continuing to read. 1 Kings chapter 10. The queen of Sheba heard how famous Solomon was. So she went to Jerusalem to test him with difficult questions. She took along several of her officials and she loaded her camels with gifts of spices, jewels and gold. When she arrived, she and Solomon... ...was. The queen was amazed at Solomon's wisdom. She was breathless when she saw his palace, the food on his table, his officials, his servants in their uniforms, the people who served his food and the sacrifices he offered at the Lord's temple. She said, Solomon, in my own country, I had heard about your wisdom and all you've done, but I didn't believe it until I saw it with my own eyes. And there's so much I didn't hear about. You are wiser and richer than I was told. And if you keep reading on, um, before she leaves, um, she gives him a stack of precious jewels and rare spices and five tons of gold. <laughs> i got a little bit of a trivia question for you. Um, can anybody guess which country holds the record for the largest coin ever made? Sorry, you can say it in a loud voice. I have a guess. Australia. Who else is making big things in the world? Australia, of course. <laughs> yep, the largest, most valuable coin in the world. Um, that is a $1 million coin. It's official minted coin. It is real, like it's official Australian currency. Um, and that is one ton of gold. It's an official one ton gold coin. Um, it actually contains one ton of gold in today's 2024 price is actually $67 million worth of gold. So the coin itself, the, the, as official currency, is worth a lot less than the materials that it's made from, if that makes sense. Um, so if you ever have access to purchase that coin, melt it down and sell, I don't know, sell it off as gold. 
So that, that's a ton of gold, and Solomon's buddy, the Queen of Sheba, just drops off five of these things before she leaves. I don't know if they had the kangaroo on it. <laughs> or Queen Elizabeth. Um, but we hear, we hear more about the kind of wealth that Solomon had in 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 14 to 25. Solomon received about 25 tons of gold a year. The merchants and traders, as well as the kings of Arabia and rulers from Israel, also gave him gold. Solomon made 200 gold shields and used about seven and a half pounds of gold for each one. I don't know pounds that much. I know babies in pounds. My kids were like three and a half, so I guess it's like two babies worth of gold. I don't know. It's the only thing that's measured in pounds these days. He also... Oh, no, that's kilos. That's kilos, isn't it? Three and a half kilos. So I don't know how many pounds a baby is. How many pounds is a baby? Oh, eight. Okay, so one baby makes a shield. One baby worth of gold. (laughs) Okay, uh, he also made 300 smaller gold shields using almost four pounds for each one. And he put the shields in his palace in Forest Hall. His throne was made of ivory and covered in pure gold. The back of the throne was rounded at the top and it had armrests on each side. There was a statue of a lion on both sides of the throne and there was a statue of a lion at both ends of each of the six steps leading up to the throne. No other throne in the world was like Solomon's. Since silver was almost worthless in those days, everything was made of gold, even the cups and dishes used in Forest Hall. Solomon had a lot of seagoing ships. Every three years he sent them out with Hiram's ships to bring back gold, silver and ivory, as well as monkeys and peacocks. He was the richest and wisest king in the world. People from every nation wanted to hear the wisdom God had given him. Year after year people came and brought gifts of silver and gold, as well as clothes, weapons, spices, horses or mules. So in case it's not obvious enough, this guy is loaded. He has it all. Each year, just in gifts alone, he's given 25 tons of gold. He's got monkeys and peacocks and fancy clothes and ivory. Um, Elsewhere, we're even told he has a personal collection of over 14,000 horses, um, just his little private collection, and all sorts of other stuff. And unsurprisingly, everyone around wants to be friends with him. He's popular, he's rich beyond comprehension, he's the wisest man on the planet, and he's married to the daughter of the king of Egypt. And yet, he's not satisfied. None of it is enough for him. He wants more. And despite how blessed he's been by God, He desperately longs for something to satisfy him. Chapter 11. The Lord did not want the Israelites to worship foreign gods, so he had warned them not to marry anyone who was not from Israel. Solomon loved his wife, the daughter of the king of Egypt, but he also loved some women from Moab, Ammon, and Edom, and others from Sidon and the land of the Hittites, 700 of his wives were daughters of kings, but he also married 300 other women. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Before this, uh, everyone else must have looked at Solomon and thought, this is the man who has everything uh, we could ever dream of, but he's still not content with what God has given him. He has this void, this sense that something's missing and he's desperately trying to find satisfaction and completion um, for Solomon despite God's commands to have one wife. uh, He takes for himself woman after woman after woman, wife after wife after wife. But still nothing satisfies his desire for more. Solomon's story kind of just goes on and it is a story of opulence and and it is the story of the man who had everything. But towards the end of his life, Solomon writes a book um, called Ecclesiastes or his his teaching sort of form this book Ecclesiastes. 
And particularly when we think of, of Sunday school and we think of what we teach kids, there might be bits and pieces that we talk about with Solomon's story, um, but I don't think we often look at his thoughts in Ecclesiastes. As Solomon reflects on all of the wisdom of his life and all that he's learned from his time being the wisest man on earth, this is his reflection about life, about earth, about human existence. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All the streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already. Long ago, it was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. It's a pretty sad picture of life, isn't it? Meaningless, unsatisfying, nothing happens that really matters. In the long-term scheme of things, nothing that happens during our lives really matters. And he sums up his own personal life in chapter 2. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all meaningless like chasing the wind, there was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. For most people, even in our wildest fantasies, we can't imagine the kind of wealth or success which Solomon had. And in our 2024 context and sort of version of that, we all, on some level, believe, you know, how amazing would my life be? if I had wealth and excess and wisdom. And yet these are the words of a man who had everything. Nothing in this world could fill that void in his life. Nothing could save his life from being meaningless. And really it's, it's not that surprising, is it? Even the celebrities, you look at the celebrities in our culture today, uh, whether that's yeah, actors and, and musicians or whether it's um, people who are famous for their business interests or because they're really rich. The rich and the famous often find life just as miserable and empty as everyone else, don't they? We always want the next thing, but then when we get it, we're still not satisfied. We want the next thing. And then if we get that, we're not satisfied. It's this pointless exercise, endless exercise. It's like chasing after the wind. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon knows what it is that we really long for. Solomon knows why it is that we're never able to fill that void with the things of this world. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11, he says, God has put eternity into the hearts of humanity. In a world that just keeps going around, where the past just fades into obscurity and the earth just keeps spinning, God has given us a yearning for something greater, for something which is not meaningless and fleeting, for something which matters, for something eternal, 
for him. That void which Solomon and you and I and every other person in human history has tried so desperately to fill with the things of this world can only be filled by the eternal God. C.S. Lewis um, put it this way in Mere Christianity, a famous book that he wrote. And out of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery. The long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. Every day, the people of our world go about our business, earning money, buying stuff, playing with whatever new gadget or tech gets released. We want people to like us. We want to be known as clever or attractive or hardworking or we want to be respected and liked. But at the end of the day, we could, we could do just as Solomon says, and, and, and he, as he does, we could achieve everything we ever dreamed of. We could deny ourselves nothing that we want. And even still, we know that it's never going to satisfy us. It's like chasing the wind. Only God can fill that void in our lives. Only God can satisfy our deepest yearnings. Only he can bring us peace and satisfaction. The band's going to come up and I'm going to pray. Let, let's, let's talk to God. Lord God, it's so easy to believe uh, the lie that we often um, are told that we just need the next thing, that the next thing will make us happy, that the next thing will make us feel satisfied. It'll cure the hunger and the thirst that we have Lord, the world often tells us um, that it holds the key, the answer to happiness, to satisfaction. Lord, we know that there's nothing in this world that will fill that void in our life, that will fill our heart, because that, um, that yearning is ultimately for you. Lord, we long for something eternal. We want something that matters, something that's not meaningless, something that won't just fade away, something that can't be lost. God, I pray for us as your people um, that you would help us to fix our eyes on you, to fix our eyes on eternity. Uh, Jesus, you spoke of treasure in heaven that doesn't perish, that doesn't fade. Paul wrote about um, keeping our gaze on you and, and on the finish line and continuing to run the race, uh, knowing the prize that awaits us. Lord, I pray that you will help us to have that perspective of eternity. Lord, you made this world to be a beautiful place. Uh, we, we, we enjoy many things in this world. But God, I pray that those things wouldn't be a distraction, that they wouldn't be a deterrent from what really matters. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who live out that value of what you're doing in this world, that we would make that our priority in life. Lord, for those of us today who are feeling unsatisfied with life, who are feeling the struggle and the weight of it, who might be feeling that life is heavy and sad and meaningless, God, I pray that we would come to you and be able to find joy and hope and meaning and peace. Lord, you are the only thing in this world that offers that. So I pray, Lord, that you would help us to receive that today. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I did remember the stool, but you're too quick, Patina. <laughs>